today I've got a really great show for you. I brought together some incredible experts and they are here to help you find out exactly how you can manage to overcome your nerves in the moments that matter. Auditions, exams and jumping on the stage. We don't want that stopping anyone. Even some of the biggest icons that we've heard of, Rihanna, Katy Perry, you would have seen those quotes at the start of our show, have all been struck by performance anxiety. So we're going to make you get to a point where you can't wait to come and audition for us. Now, we're going to be having some great discussions with lots of good tips for you. And there'll be points where you can find out more about the things that we're talking about. So do follow along in the Q&A and the chat where we will be posting important links and further information so you can go and explore more. But I think it's time that we met one of our first guests. So we are going to take a look at why performance anxiety actually happens. And I'd like to announce my first guest. He is an expert in all aspects of performance as an academic at the Australian Institute of Music, but as a tried, tested, true icon of music, theatre, film, and also he's actually an expert in all things managing performance anxiety. Please welcome the incredible David McLeod. Hi, David. Hi, so Sally. good to see you. Good to see you too. Now, David, I think you're a really great example of how lucky the students are at the Australian Institute of Music because we know that everyone can experience this. And not only are you a practising artist for years and years, an academic, you're actually also an expert in a particular technique, which we're going to talk about in a moment, but you have a great program. Um, Big Breath Productions where you're a specific expert in this very need for people. So take a seat, we're gonna have okay. a chat about that. So first up, I wanna know about you. Uh, so essentially, David has been on all sorts of TV shows. Many of you, your mums would even know about too. They probably had a poster up and a crush, um, <laughs> but also some of the biggest name musicals that you've all heard of, Chess. Um, so many to help me out here, um, so many that you've done. But I want to focus today, though, on the fact that you know all elements and sides to performance anxiety. So can you share a bit about your time as a performer and, and sort of how you dealt with it at first? Because I think it comes up for everyone. Um, well, my journey with the whole breathing th thing started over 30 years ago. Um, I, I went... At the peak of my career, I smashed my leg to pieces, uh, centre stage. It, so you literally a broke a leg? Yeah, I on literally stage. broke a leg. And up until that point, I didn't really have m many problems with performance anxiety. And after the leg re recovered and I re entered the business at, a, at quite a high level, I, was, I had suffered performance anxiety. And it fascinated me why I would be feeling all these things that I never felt that were very palpable mm. and I'm um, quite negative <clears throat> and what, what I could do about it. So instead of um, becoming an alcoholic or a heroin addict or any of those <laughs> Don't things. Don't do those. For those of the audience at home, do not do those things. I started do to study David's breathing. Um, and my first port of call was uh, at a Buddhist retreat studying Vipassana. So that was 30 years ago. And it's just carried right through and that's how I dealt with it. And everything's kind of come full circle for me and I'm now qualified in certain areas to teach certain, uh, the Bateco breathing technique, which I'm qualified. Uh, I do other things too and that's how I dealt with it and that's how I help other people deal with it. Um, and that's, there's many different modalities of breathing. There's Wim Hof, for example. I chose the Bateco breathing to study because it's a lot gentler. I do some work for nursing agencies and I can't really grab 80 year old people and throw them in ice baths. So yeah. <laughs> that's why I go the Bateco route. Um, I think that's a good point too, in that this, this kind of performance anxiety can happen in any setting. And so- Everything's a performance. So this means that there are all sorts of different techniques that our audience and others can engage. And I'm really fascinated um, to sort of know what are the first types of things you recommend when you, you know, you're around performers all the time, the students at the Australian Institute of Music, your other clients, 
what are the what are the first things that you sort of say to them about being able to turn breathing from something we all thought was fairly simple, but there's more to it? Well, it's a you know anxiety is a vast area, but all practitioners agree, you know, including uh, GPs and everybody, that a basic understanding of the autonomic nervous system and the fight and flight response and the rest and digest response, which is parasympathetic and sympathetic, um, you know, goes a long way to a basic understanding of that is where, is where you begin. And the, which we'll find out a little bit later. Yes, we will. The quickest, the quickest hack into that autonomic nervous system is through correct breathing. So people say to me sometimes, oh, ha, 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 you know, you're a breathing retrainer, but everybody breathes, you know, what's the big deal? Well, everybody <clears throat> that eats is alive <laughs> as well, but what kind of life are we talking about? So uh, what kind of food do you eat? How did you digest your food, etc. You know, Roger is alive, but his mm. diet is appalling. So he's headed for a heart attack. He has psoriasis, he has bad breath, he's bad company. Just like we need to digest food at an optimum level, we also need to digest oxygen at an optimum level in our respiratory system. I guess it's like anything, uh, particularly if you're a performer, to the breathing and singing and dancing and getting through a live performance in a band and those kinds of things. We need to be able to, to train and fine tune our body. So I guess it's a little bit like that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's Absolutely. a bit able to get to that next level of performance. Absolutely. And so breathing retraining is used in all sorts of performances now. Um, and it's all, all science-based. So it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, the Bateko method is all about, <clears throat> pardon me, a return to nasal breathing <clears throat> and diaphragmatic breathing. And it's used with high-level athletes and coming more and more mainstream in that area, as well as in, uh, you know, performances, contemporary, theatrical presenters, actors, um, yeah, the sports world is coming alive with it now. Excellent. So what are some of the kinds of things that you do with performers to help them? Um, what would a typical class or where would you start? Okay, I mean, we have such little time tonight to actually, mm. which we will be demonstrating yeah. something, I believe, a little bit later. And I've just picked one thing which will cover a few areas. So which the exercise that I will show will, is the quickest hack to, to flip the autonomic nervous system into the rest and digest and take it out of a fight and flight. So we all need a little bit of adrenaline and we all need fight and flight, but we need a healthy balance. So, so you're saying the nerves before an audition yes. could be a good thing. You could weaponize it to your advantage. Yes. But, 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 you know, like uh, too many of them is just counterproductive to cognitive function. Mm. And as a performer, you know, you're multitasking at a high skilled level, you know, and, what, and whatever way you look at, you know, being a musician or a singer, if, you know, you're going to have to perform in front of people mm. at some point. So you really do need to get a grip on it. And I think a lot of talented people have, have let that stop them. Yeah. And so it's good for them to know that there are places and professionals. 30 years ago you started this, so I can't imagine the wealth of knowledge that you and the Big Breath team have that you can bring out and help people with. So mm. why don't we do some of that now? Why don't we? Because we do have a lot of people in our audience at home throughout the world who are probably again feeling really nervous about heading into that audition. Maybe you've all ready to do an audition for Australian Institute of Music or maybe you've got performance exams. So we want to give you one thing that you can start doing today. And I believe, David, you've invited along a couple of our current students to actually help give a bit of a demonstration of something that we can oh, do yeah. today. So let's welcome them. Um, so David, thank you so much. We have the incredible Rosanna and Jeff, and they are both studying the Bachelor of Music Theatre. So auditions are very much going to be a part of your future um, and a big part of how you obviously succeeded. You went and did auditions to come to the Australian Institute of Music. So welcome. And our audience 
were in your shoes that you were in not so long ago. So, Jeff, tell me how you were feeling back before you auditioned. Tell us about your audition experience. Oh, when I first came to AIM, uh, I came to a workshop run by David. Uh, I've never felt absolute, to be honest, absolutely terrified. Yeah. Uh, I sang a song uh, on the street where you live from My Fair Lady, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, David worked me through uh, how to how to breathe properly because I, I I was singing, but I felt like my breathing was out of control. So he showed me, uh, he demonstrated what what to do, how to control the breathing, and I'm, I'm my, one of my biggest uh, bad habits. I'm a, I'm a biggest mouth breather. <laughs> he showed me how to breathe through my nose, which definitely calmed me down, it centered me, it controlled nerves and I was yeah it went from from uh, fight to flight that's really clever that you actually you know you sought out ways to manage your nerves before the audition so you were sort of going into that training and coaching mode how long before you did it did you find out about um, David and one of his kind of workshops and that kind of thing uh, I'm very new to this whole uh, at the, before uh, for the workshop, I, I did come to Open Day, so yeah, where I first met David, um, and yeah, he invited me to this workshop. They were running to, for for new musical theatre students, and uh, yeah, I knew absolutely nothing about of uh, of, of this, these uh, tools and techniques, and yeah, it was definitely a, a huge game changer for me. Well, it was a great tip there, so um, make sure to go to Open Days because you never know; you might just get that inside edge on something there. But I think it's a great example that when you do study somewhere specialist, you're able to be able to have people like you, David, come into the classroom. And as I was saying, you know this from every angle. You've auditioned yourself and clearly been very successful. And you're able to bring all of that, plus the knowledge that you and the team have at Big Breath that you started. So, Rosanna. Hi. Now, what about those out there doing performance exams? Ooh, well, you would have done many of those. Definitely, I've done many and I've performed on stage many times, but I definitely still get the nerves every single time. And I think something that can help with managing the nerves is preparation. Yes. Because if you can control what you can control, then by the time you're actually on stage, you can actually feel like you can let go of whatever else happens that you can't control. So when you leave, you know that you've done the best that you could have done. Something else that helps um, is, I guess, reframing your mindset and understanding that your teachers or whoever you're auditioning for, they want you to do the best job as well. Aww. Absolutely. Yes. <clears throat> we really do. It's true. <laughs> You've heard it from David himself. We're on your side. We want you to, we're not willing you to, to fail or be bad. We, we want you to succeed. And you all know exactly how the students are feeling because yeah. you've been there too. It's very sympathetic. So um, I would love to know, we're going to set the scene. We're going to do an example. David is going to give you an incredible tool that you can learn and use now that will help with a range of different things for when you start feeling a bit nervous and anxious. So setting the scene, I'm going to get these guys to help me out. You are walking into an audition for your dream role. What is it, Rosanna, and why? I'm just going to have to say Alphaba from Wicked. Alphaba from Wicked. You know, loved it. Loved very musical. Very witchy girl <laughs> here. You certainly put a spell on me and our crowd out there, I no doubt. What about you, Jeff? What's your dream role? What are you going in for today? Oh, let, let's go with uh, Jean Valjean from Le Miserable. Why? Because to, the famous quote is, uh, to, to love another person is to see the face of God. That is too deep for this time of the day. I will be auditioning for the role of Toto in The Wizard of Oz. Roof. Okay, now I'm going to hand over to you, David. I believe you've come pre-prepared. All right. And I'm going to get this happening. So tell us what we're doing. Okay. Follow along and take note. So, Rosanna, if I could have you just sit down. And, Jeff, we're going to roll out a green carpet for you. Ooh, and this, ex this exercise is a formal exercise, everybody. So, so even though it's a formal exercise, what I'm going to do with these, with these two guys is, is formal. <clears throat> but the thing is, everybody was born breathing this way. So everybody was born breathing with their diaphragm. You look a little baby on a bunny rug and you won't see any of this area move at all. Um, and <clears throat> this exercise will cover, can be a hands-on tool 
Although if I'm doing a full course or a full workshop or working with a client, it becomes part of a breathing drill. It becomes part of your musical practice. You know, practice does make permanent. Um, but we, we, we're pushed for time. So can you point to your belly button? Okay, and Rosanna, what I'd like you to do is without sitting too stiff, is to put one hand over your belly button and the other hand on your chest. And I want you both now to just start to not breathe through your mouth at all. So breathe through your mouth as much as you would eat through your nose. Okay, so, okay. You try this along at home. And just slow your breathing down in your own way. And when on the inhale, you'll notice that the box, the famous <laughs> orange lunch box goes up and on the exhale, it will go down. So nice language to, yes, Zoe, please. So nice language for me to use here is on the inhale as it's coming up. And on the exhale, we wanna draw our belly button gently, and gently being the operative word, gently towards the spine. And you'll notice with, I've got to keep my eye on Zoe here because she's a novice, but you'll notice that none of the chest area or the neck muscles are moving at all. And this is what you'll see with a baby on a bunny rug, unless there's some unfortunate underlying medical condition, nothing will move. So around the ages, you guys just keep going and slow down as you're going. For human beings around the ages of 13 to 15, a lot of us become upper chest breathers, mouth breathers. Uh, it's, just, it's not good. So we want to return to diaphragmatic breathing. And concerning anxiety, it's the quickest hack into the autonomic nervous system and it's, it flicks a switch. It connects with the vagus nerve you have to look this up. There's not enough time for me to explain. You can tell that you were on an iconic Australian medical show with this. It comes out very easily. <laughs> I didn't know much about it then <laughs> and had no stage fright. Um, and it's, there's, it's like a switch. So you want to switch it into the parasympathetic, which is rest and digest. And this is one of the quickest ways to do it. Why I've got Rosanna sitting up is as a hands-on tool, if you ha have an audition to go into, why don't you take yourself to a private room, sit on a couch. If that's not the case, you could go to the bathroom, put your timer on your phone on for five minutes, relax, close your mouth, start breathing through your nose if it's not blocked or if you don't have a deviated septum, that's a whole nother novel and there's ways around that and start. And if you do this properly for five minutes, you're gonna walk out after that with markedly, it's just science, with markedly lower levels of stress. So how are we going there, Jeff? I don't want you to fall to sleep. But speaking of falling to sleep, if, you're, if it's the night before the audition, and it's all about the night before the audition, and as, uh, as Rosanna said, preparation, you've got to have preparation. You've got to know your stuff, guys. Zoe was saying before about butterflies. So one of the favourite sayings for me when I do a little bit of cognitive, cognitive therapy behaviour is, the students love this saying, it's fine to have butterflies, just let them fly in formation. If you think about that, you have a good day, eat properly, have a good night's sleep. If it's looping around and around, the fear and everything, try this exercise. Don't put the timer on and you'll probably fall to sleep after about 10 minutes if you're doing it properly. Let's see that box move a little bit more. Come on, Jeff. Fantastic. And on the exhale, drawing your belly button gently towards your spine. How's everyone going at home? I hope that you're joining along. And uh, if you even want more coaching too, you can come to AIM. Here is one of the amazing teachers that you will have, or you can access a range of workshops and information. So do check out Big Breath. That would be a great tip, I think. Yeah. And um, I think any final tips uh, to get our techniques right from you, David? Because I'm not sure I'm quite there yet. Okay, well, like I said, some, uh, and I'm constantly amazed, I think, oh, people will find this boring. 
many people, many people, when I start running them through this, uh, and I, Jeff, you were initially like this, found it very uncomfortable and very unnatural to be breathing how I'm showing you now. A lot of people do, which immediately tells me if I haven't watched them already or asked them a series of questions, that they've lost diaphragmatic breathing. So dancers and musicians, presenters, actors, who are mouth breathing and upper chest breathing are breathing far too fast. And so from a biochemical point of view, this is restricting and constricting blood vessels. It's tipping your autonomic nervous system into fight and flight. From a biomechanical point of view, if you're not breathing with your diaphragm, you are negating core strength, you're negating proper lymphatic drainage, and you're setting yourself up for accidents, especially if you're an actor or a musician or a sports person, and on and on, we, on and on and on we go, you know. Breathing's really important. If you think of the influence that breathing has on your emotions, then you think of the effect that your emotions can have on your breathing, and then on top of that, the impact that your breathing has on your sleep, follow me here, and then the impact that your sleep, or the lack of it, has on your emotions the next day, your performance, your exam, your speech or whatever, you can see where this all starts to come into play and make sense. How are you feeling, Rosanna? Quite calm and relaxed. <laughs> what about you, Jeff? Good, Other don't than to being sleep. on a stage lying there with an orange box there, I have to say, David, I feel incredibly relaxed too, almost a little too relaxed. <laughs> so how do, what do I do to get the energy back up? So <laughs> do I breathe faster? Do no, I change you, my you, technique? What do I do? To get your energy back up? Mm. Well, you, you would just, I don't know, do some mild stretching, do some walking, mm. do some... Excellent. But you don't want to be too whipped up. No. You know, you really, you really don't. You know, especially if you're, if you are a, um, if you're a wind instrument player, you know, you want to have all of this down. Most, most wind instrument players do have breathing down, even if, you know, they've been taught several techniques anyway. The last thing you want to be if you're going into an audition or a meeting or a performance is, is too whipped up. You want to find that balance. How do we find the balance? Through the, through the autonomic nervous system. We all have one, you know, and there's two basic sections, fight and flight, rest and digest. You'll find that most people who deal with dramas and things that are quite well balanced, you go, gee, I wish I could be like that. Oh, why aren't they nervous when they've got the balance right? And they're prob they, they would definitely be breathing diaphragmatically. This is formal. So, you know, that's formal. What does informal look like? Like this. None of this is moving. Mm. So the rest, there's, this is the best exercise I could give you in this limit of time. There's all sorts of nasal exercises, of course, and when I work with athletes, you know, just moving stuff, but this is, this is at the heart of it, guys. This is, this is, this is where it all starts. So there is your start and you now have a tool that you can use for many different situations because, as David was saying earlier, we want you to do really well in your auditions. We want you to succeed. We don't want you terrified or, even worse, not doing it at all. Yeah. So I would love to thank, and we better help them up, our we wonderful... We've got to help Jeff up here. Jeff. There we go, Jeff. Love to thank our incredible guests, the one, the only amazing David McLeod from Big Breath Productions and Australian Institute of Music. We also have, of course, coming to the main stage near you, we have the incredible right. Rosanna and Jeff. So thanks so much. Let me just be the stage hand here. Oh, and thanks for sorry. joining us <laughs> right now. And Take your mat. All right, go. thank you. Have to do everything around here. <laughs> okay.
Well, that is what it is all about for us at the Australian Institute of Music. We want to make sure that when our students come with us, that we give them the right tools to help equip them. So throughout your studies, where you're being inspired by all of the amazing artists and makers around you, it's about putting in the right tools to help you have a career that lasts and be able to perform when it counts, which let's face it, is all the time. So we've given you your insider tip so you're ready. Now that you're feeling super confident, let's get a glimpse into the mind of someone who sits behind that all important audition panel. And we're going to give you what they're really thinking. Okay, from someone who knows what it's like to do auditions, he is an incredible, multinational performing jet setting contemporary jazz musician academic and as I said he's been in auditions and he's sat on the other side please welcome Mr Julian Goff we also have the incredible Chris Cox who holds virtually many prospective students' hands as they go through the process. He's heard them say they're nervous. He's given them tips and advice and importantly, he knows how it all works. Please welcome Chris Cox. Hello. Hey. Welcome. Take a seat on the couch. We'll just have a nice little friendly chat. Thanks, Zoe. Okay. Right. <coughs> So who do we think for the finals on the weekend? Another bit of culture for those outside Australia. I think um, we'll move on to more important things. So Julian, this is something that you do know, both as a musician and a performer, but you also watch a, a lot of auditions. What is the first thing that you want students to know about walking into an audition? What is the panel thinking? Right. Well, just I should say, firstly, I'm completely relaxed now. I, David <laughs> McLeod's thing, we, I was on the couch there and you, you were there as well. I was br we're breathing we, through our diaphragm. We were breathing, it was diaphragm all the way, yep. so <laughs> we may not be too coherent now. I'm feeling, <laughs> you know, what was the question again? Very, very No, it's all right, it's all right. <laughs> um, Okay, so, okay, here's the thing about auditions, right? Like, when you come in and you, you do an audition and... Uh, you're only doing, or we're only, sorry, we're only watching the audition part, yeah. right? So we're only seeing the bit where the, the singer comes on and actually sings a song. And we're only focusing on that little bit. But if you are coming in and you're the auditionee, you're not just doing that little bit, right? You've, you're actually doing the whole walk into the room. Uh, you're doing the setup. You're doing the, I'm going to get, get myself ready. I've got to go through all that process and then I will actually start doing the singing. And the problem that happens all the time, and I've seen it hundreds of times, I've done hundreds of auditions, and the problem that I see all the time is, is that, that uh, the audition, auditionee will come in and they've prepared the piece. They're at 100%. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So they're, they're at 100% and they're feeling really good about it but they haven't done all the other stuff. Now, we're only mm. focusing on that bit, and that's fine. But the bit that they haven't done is the visualisation bit. And this is the bit that um, I learnt about a few years ago after a calamitous experience that I had. Oh, I'm going to ask more about that in a minute. Oh, uh, you, you, you don't need to, right? I <laughs> think <laughs> we need to. <laughs> OK, so, so, so the first thing I would say to a, a, a student is... Practice visualising every part of um, from outside of the room to being in the room and being prepared and being ready to go. And so that actually means in real time, spending the time to imagine what it's like to walk into an audition room so and to see a panel it. there. And you do that and you walk in and you set yourself up and you actually do it in real time in your own mind and go through it several times and allow that anxiety to rise up and then do David's thing where you start breathing and you start dealing with that and if you do this several times and you go through the process you will you'll find that by the fourth or fifth time you've actually lost the nerves about the walk-in about the setup okay so that's the first thing so you in a lot of ways they have done this before it's familiar and I think yeah. that 
unfamiliarity can sometimes throw us. That's exactly right. It's like I, I think of all those TV shows that many of you watch, the talent-based ones, where they almost amplify that walk to the audition panel. It's like the dread moment. Well, that's exactly right. Mm. And if you don't plan that and, and practice that in your own mind, that's the bit that's going to cause you the most anxiety because people do get prepared for the actual performance. It's all that other stuff that they don't yeah. get prepared for. The second thing I'd say is, is once you're there, right, you've arrived at your point, don't rush the next 20, mm. 30 seconds. Be, be prepared to take what you think is too long, because it won't be too long, because time moves much more quickly in these situations, but allow yourself to have that extra 20, 30, even 40 seconds, even a minute before you start to do your performance. So you're not just wanting everyone to just come in, rush through and get out. Because I think people do feel anxious. They're thinking, oh, I've got to come in. I can't, I can't make the panellists wait longer for me. No, no. It's, it's kind it, of the opposite. It's the, the, the old approach of what we would call the cattle call, which is that no, number 36 come in, you've got a number and then you put it down and you go da 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 da, da and you sing, that's right, right out. That, that doesn't the happen. The hook comes out. Yeah, yeah. the hook comes out. The, the whole approach mm -hmm. here is we want you to be able to produce whatever it is that you've got inside you yeah. and whatever you've prepared for. And if that takes another minute, if it takes two minutes, we're comfortable with that. You should become comfortable with that as well. So an example of that would be um, a pianist coming in and the stool is not mm -hmm. set at the right height. And, ah. and they'll sit there and it, it, it'll just feel not quite right. Take the time to set the, you know, like, raise it up, put it exactly in the position and then sit there and centre yourself. It, it'll seem like a very long time. It's not. Take your time and then start your performance. So would you say as um, an audition panellist, you would actually just see that as a performer, I guess, getting the tools right, getting ready rather than it be, a, oh, well, we've got to get to the next one. So it's exactly right. It's it, exactly right. Probably so more impressive. Take it's. It's actually. It, you, you're totally right. Being in control of that situation mm. is 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 impressive to to us, as it is to an audience. Mm. Like if you're if you're out on, and you walk out on stage, and you immediately pick up your instrument, and start playing. People go. Guy looks a little bit tense. We've paid all yeah. this money to see this. But if they're relaxed, they set themselves up slowly. They wave. They they get themselves comfortable. It, it's a, it's the sign of somebody who is confident and in control, and you and you yeah. want to see that. Something and it's, I was gonna say. Sorry, I picked up from what you were saying. It feels like you really see this as their time, so your time as the student auditioning, rather than it being them coming into your space. I think that's a brilliant way to look at it. It's yeah, we're we're there for you. It's not the other way around. Um, yeah, I hadn't thought of it like that. So that's that's yeah. great. So the second, can I make three points? Yeah, right. so we, the, we'll have four if you've got it. Oh, uh, I can make one up. Uh, the second point is 100% uh, preparedness is not enough. Uh, and I know this myself from being in situations where I've, I feel like I've got a piece pretty much under control. Mm. I'm a saxophone player, right? So I'll be going, yeah, that's okay. That bit's not, yeah, but it'll be okay. Because I can play it sort of like, that's the bit that is going to cause you the most stress. And when it causes you the most stress, you are, everything else will start to fray around the edges because you're worried about this bit that's coming up in the middle eight or whatever it might be. So I always say to anybody doing recitals or anything like that, be at 120%. Be it, and what that means is you're to a point where you're bored with your pieces. You've, you've, had, you've played them so many times, it's kind of like... Okay. But I'll, it gives I'll, you a level of comfort, doesn't it? You are it? totally yeah. comfort, comfortable. And then you'll be at 100%. Yeah. Right? The third piece of advice I give everybody is um, don't overcomplicate. And examples of that will be I've had guitarists who've come in to audition and I'm only focusing on that guitarist and that guitarist performance. And if they want to have a band around them, that's lovely for them. But I'm not focusing on the band. I'm focusing on, on that person. Well, that person. actually then hinder them because you might be thinking that they're sort of, what, their talent and what they're trying to show is a bit hidden and masked within that. So they're not giving themselves the best chance. It's, it, it can be that. It can be a little bit of that. But really what happens is it just causes anxiety and stress because somebody will come in and they'll go, right, well, I've got all these pedals. Mm -hmm. You know, guitarists love pedals. So if, <laughs> if you're a guitarist out there, I know you love pedals. Right, you'll have them all set up, right? 
pick your best pedals. Don't bring the whole lot in because something will go wrong on the day. Um, uh, in, inevitably, it's, it's Murphy's mm. Law. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. If you've got a choice of five band members, you know, and you can get away with three, bring the three in. If you've got a drum kit that's got, like, all these extra cymbals and what have you to, to set up that all need their own felts, and, and, but you can get away with, say, three cymbals, come with three. And, and I always say the, the less complicated it is, the less stress and anxiety it's going to induce, induce with you. And I say this about everything, about recitals as well, people who are doing their final recital. I say, have a quartet, have a trio, have, do some solo stuff. You don't need a band of 30 people to come on stage. It will just, somebody won't turn up and it will, it will make you... You can't get the costumes coordinated exact, quite right exactly. because one person. You know, you can't match the shoes and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a disaster. We tried today and it just yeah. didn't come. So, Julian... What if we've done everything um, right? We've done all our prep work. We've got to 120%. We've been practicing the techniques that David showed us. We've visualized. We come in. I've lost the band. I've brought in just the three. Something does go wrong. What should I do? I'm in the middle of it and I, and I blow a note. I do it, something goes wrong. What should I do at that point? Because oh, well, stuff does happen. Oh, How look, can someone get back on track? That's totally fine it's totally cool the, the important thing in these situation is to be able to recover and it's like this in in any sort of idiom that you might be doing it might like in sport for example i'm a big afl fan and it, and it will be the brisbane brisbane will win just by the way but anyway uh uh it, it's about recovery it's about your ability to be able to uh i was about to say pick up the ball but it's actually we're talking music now it's about being able to, to uh to find a way through uh, and it's all, almost worth practicing mistakes as well practicing what am I going to do if this doesn't mm. happen and that doesn't happen how will I actually pick it up and and as a saxophonist this happens all the time for me where there'll be a passage and something will happen I'll be distracted from something and I won't I won't be able to play that little bit know where you can pick it up and recover from and in many ways it's important to know that that actually can be more impressive to an auditioner. If something does happen, if the music switches off temporarily or a band member yeah. plays something wrong and you're able to navigate through that, that's a plus. I think there's a good lesson in this for all of us too. So Julian has literally travelled the world and is really highly regarded in terms of as a musician, as a saxophonist. And you said that there are moments where you might lose focus and get something wrong in a passage. So it even happens after all these years. So you can be at the top of your game. So it's cool, we're human. Even the best get parts of a passage wrong. So do remember that. And it also means that you understand that that's a natural part of the journey as an artist as it's well. A, it, for me, especially because I'm a jazz musician and we're notoriously lazy, so we never <laughs> learn anything properly. But. But, but that's part of the creative process, is to be able to make mistakes and be able to find your way through it. And it happens, the, the best musicians on stage all the time, little things happen all the time. It's the way of it. Very, very cool. Chris, you, would, you hear from students a lot of the time. So Chris is our student recruitment manager. And so one of the things that your team does is they actually set up auditions and things like that. What are some of the worries and things that you hear on the phone from students or over over chat? Yeah. Um, so that they know they're normal. Yeah, I think they would like to know more information, maybe about the duration, how long the songs are. Um, uh, they would like to know, you know, which type of songs should they choose? Um, uh, what's, what's the process? How do they apply for the audition? Uh, yeah, those those type of questions. So, Julian, we've once we've got past the nerves, we've entered the room. What kinds of what do you want to see? Do you want to see distinction in the pieces? What is it that you're looking for as a panel? I, I guess, the the simplest answer to that is is contrast. I'd like to see contrast. I'd ah. like to see uh, a, a piece that might show off somebody's technical prowess. It doesn't even need to be particularly long. Um, it might be a study, it could be, if you're a, a pianist, it could be an etude, um, 
I talk from a saxophone perspective, there's lots of attitudes and studies. They're kind of scalic in, in, in their form. And the other piece uh, might be something which is more expressive. So if you're a singer, you might do something which is quite wordy and quite tricky and quite rhythmical, and that would be kind of more the technical piece, and uh, a ballad. But singing two ballads, you're not going to be showing us anything differently in the second ballad from what you showed us in the first ballad. And the other thing I'd say is what might be contrasting to you may not be contrasting to us. So I've had plenty of guitarists who've come on and they're like metal guitarists, for example, and I say, what do you get? what's your first piece? Oh, it's this metal piece, blah, 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 blah. And I go, okay, great, and they play that. What's your second piece? Oh, it's also a metal piece, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, for them, it's totally different. Yeah. But for me, to my ears, and I'm, and, and, uh, I'm not tuned into this particular type of metal, I won't hear the difference. So mm. make sure it's contrasting not just to you, but also for other people who you play it to. That might be your parents or your friends or your, your, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whatever it might be. So remember... Just because you know the difference between Norwegian death metal and Swedish death metal doesn't mean that Julian and the panellists will. So I'm going back to square one. I will not be doing my two Beastie Boys songs that I definitely think the rhymes and rhythms are quite different. That is a really important thing. And I would say, Chris, we were talking the other day and we've sort of noticed too that students will often sort of, but if I throw in this, can I add this? One of the things that we'd really recommend is read exactly what is being asked of you. Um, that can sometimes also be part of the test as well. So, um, for example, if you're trying out for music theatre too and there's elements to show acting, the dancing, um, make sure that that variation is there as well. So mm. read what is being asked of you. And sometimes it isn't about adding more, it's about sticking to those instructions. Because a lot of what what we might do in the creative industries you might have to follow direction you might need to and as you heard from Julian he is looking to hear and see different things and that gives you that clue so I wanted to come back to something that you said before when we're talking about practice and perfect and that kind of thing Chris does have to hold the hands of a lot of people he sees them really nervous and that kind of thing why are we even doing auditions? Because sometimes when we're in high school, we've got marks from doing music subjects and things like that. Why do we audition? It's, Why put them through it? It's a very good question. The, the, um, in a school situation, you have uh, long-term qualitative analysis. So mm. you're able to watch a student grow from when they start, let's say they're in high school, from year seven up to year 12. And I, and I agree with you in some sense. I think they're, that having these quantitative exams at the very end, kind of why do we need to do that? Unfortunately, in this situation, we don't have that. We have got some qualitative stuff, i.e. we've got um, people's records of what they've done at school. That's kind of useful information. Also, if somebody has got information that uh, uh, telling, telling us about the bands that they've been playing in, that shows us their intent and it also shows us their drive. They might be uh, coming from uh, adversity and yet they've actually been able to put together bands and do all this kind of stuff. That, that's a really big positive thing. But at the end of the day, we do still need to hear people play and there's only one way really to be able to do it and that is through this process that we call the audition. But as I keep stressing, our form of auditioning is not the same as the old days. I mean, when I auditioned way back when the world was black and white, it was a really difficult process. Are you liking colour? Yeah, yeah, that's right. My, the world back then, everybody talked quickly and it was a, it was a you know, the 1920s. So uh, <laughs> it was a difficult difficult. Uh, uh, process and it was a very, very like a like a hard nose process. It's completely different now. So whilst we still have to do it, it's a softer, a softer environment. And I guess too, it is talent based. And as you all witnessed with my Toto audition, I can't, I didn't cut it. So I think too, it's no, all you'd, about you'd, making you'd, sure you'd never get in. You're, you're right. It's you're true, right. It's true. Um, I think. It really is actually about the fact that we need people to come in and feel confident and capable too. So it, it's really important too. Um, I think that's really great tips there. 
So just to go back though, then you're not looking for perfection in an audition? No, I'm looking for potential. Potential. It's, it's all about potential. It's, it's people who perform perfectly and perform brilliantly, well, they probably are on the road already. What we're looking for are people who are, have, um, have a drive, have a passion for music. I mean, we are filled with musicians here. Um, and people talk music in the corridor, people do music sitting down on these there's couches on either side of us. They've, every day there's somebody sitting on there composing, playing, writing. It's, it's about finding people who are right for the environment as well. And so it's passion, exuberance, uh, but it's potential at the mm. end of the day. It's the most important thing. Yeah, we, we don't need you to come ready-made and we possibly don't want you to um, because one of the best things that coming and studying somewhere like the Australian Institute of Music is that opportunity to collaborate, to learn new things. Um, later, I'm going to talk to Julian all about Norwegian death metal. Mm. And these are the sorts of things that we find out and I'm sure that you'll teach me a little thing or two about some areas of jazz. So that's one of the amazing things about this environment. Chris, I want to come back to you. Um, how do students go about auditioning at AIM? Everyone does it different, but all the sorts of techniques and advice that we've heard today underpin it to make sure that you can make your audition count. Chris, how do we do it at the Australian Institute of Music? Yeah, so first uh, students need to submit an application. Yeah. Um, before they submit an application, they need to choose the course. We have a range of courses available in music. So they could book an appointment with the recruitment team, an online consultation or book Your a- very a, own appointment with Chris and his team. Yeah. Um, and then we, they could, the team can help uh, find the suitable course for the student. Second step is to submit an application online. Uh, it's direct online through our website. That application will go to the recruitment team and then the team will follow up and start to prepare uh, the students for the audition process. So they're helped right along the way? Absolutely, yes. We, they're guided by, uh, along the way, along the journey. Uh, they are sent the audition requirements in detail so they get an understanding of what's expected. Now, if I'm not sure of anything, what can I do? Should I call, contact? Absolutely, yeah. You can, you can call the office, the recruitment office. You can uh, request an appointment online through our website, through Calendly. Uh, we can book a consultation, a Zoom online consultation or a face-to-face -face consultation. And if you're nearby Melbourne or Sydney campus, you could just pop in. Yeah, absolutely. We can pop in. We've got team members available to, to talk with all the students and answer any questions they have regarding the course and the audition requirements. Now, Chris, you made me think of something very important. We do have audience members from all over the world and not just nearby. Um, do I have to fly to Australia to audition if I'm in Bergen? or anywhere else in the world? Absolutely not. So if you're overseas or if you're out of state, you have the ability to audition and online. Brilliant. Um, Julian, I know that people can sometimes think, oh, if I audition online, will I still be able to have the impact that a student auditioning in person? Will you notice me if I, if I provide an online audition? And by that, what do we mean? Is it live online? Are you up at 3 a.m. while I'm in Santiago? Or how does that work for the online, for those regional or in different parts of the world? Well, thankfully, I'm not up at 3 a.m. That's good. That's, uh, hey, you do it because you're pretty dedicated. Um, I, uh, you, you, no. Uh, but uh, what I will say is that uh, it, it's important to get, when you do your audition, not to cut it. So ah. if you do a piece of music... Uh, and you think it's cool to have multiple angles, it's actually better that you don't because what I want to see is a full performance. And I would like to be, and you can stop between pieces of course, so you can cut between pieces, but a, a complete from, from A to Z uh, performance of a particular work is what I would really like to see. Otherwise it's, it, it does uh, throw into question, have you actually stopped and then done that bit and then stopped and then gone back and done that bit and kind of then cobbled something together. It's definitely the case if it was my audition. Mine too these days. But, but um, so, so if you could do that, that, that would be helpful for us. So Julian, 
just saying there is no disadvantage if a student is pre-recording and uploading their audition if they're living regionally in Australia yep. or in another country. Absolutely not. There's no discrimination in, in any way. And so it is a pre-record thing and not not a, uh, a live at 3am thing? We, we have done live ones, thankfully not at 3am, but uh, certainly we have done live Zoom sessions, um, auditions, and that can be arranged as well. Brilliant. And that's kind of a cool thing because it gives us an opportunity to also to have a chat to it, because I love chatting to the auditionees. I think it's a really, really important part of the process. There's often lots of interesting hidden information that you, you'll, you'll find out about somebody that's always positive. I've been doing this and I was doing that. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, I haven't written it anywhere, but I did this. And that's really good intel for us. Oh, brilliant. So really, the choice can be yours if you feel that you will do better with that. So, Chris, what is next for everyone that's now feeling confident, excited, and they just want to come and make music with us? Yeah, they could reach out to us online via our website. Uh, they could book a consultation. We could chat more about the course and the audition application process. Happy to book and schedule a tour, show you the campus in Sydney and Melbourne. And applications for um, study period 1, 20, 24 are open now. So get thinking about your auditions, ask about the courses, and I have to say, Thank you for the incredible insights you've now heard from the mind of a panellist and someone that organises and helps you. So you are well looked after. We want you to succeed. And that's about all we've got time for. I'd love to bring back all of our guests today because I want to give them a big warm welcome. So could you please at your remote places throughout the world, put your hands together and thank the incredible and generous help from Jeff, future Broadway star, Rosanna West and Rosanna. We have the incomparable David McLeod, Big Breath Productions and Australian Institute of Music and many, many different television show reruns on streaming services near you. Oh we have the incredible Chris Cox and the man himself, Julian Goff, saxophonist and well-renowned contemporary musician and artist. So good luck with your auditions and your performances. Come, make music with us. And from me to you and all of us, thank you for allowing the Australian Institute of Music in to your homes, buses or wherever you are tuning in right now. I'm Zoe Wall and it has been a pleasure. Bye. <laughs>